Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you here at the Argo Cosmos stage at Melting Pot at Colors of Ostrava. My name is Chili Novakova, and it's my great honor to present you Peter S. Beagle, a renowned American author of fantasy especially. He's written quite a number of books, from which the best known is, of course, The Last Unicorn, but in the Czech editions you might have also seen A Fine and Quiet Place, translated as Opinemkia Misto, and also in Calabria, translated as Calabri. So, Peter, thank you so much for coming. And although the discussion is titled Not Just About Unicorns, my first question is actually about unicorns, because you have tackled this interesting mythical creature in so many of your works, not just The Last Unicorn, but also To Heart, the sequel story to it, and the first uh, later published version of The Last Unicorn, and also in Calabria and in some short stories. So what has drawn you to this mythical creature? What do you consider most fascinating about it? I never intended or expected to be the unicorn guy. I really didn't, um, and I tried to get rid of the, the title, the unicorns, as long as I could. One of my old friends in the science fiction field is Ursula Le Guin, or was, and I tried to make a deal with her to trade, to trade my unicorns, even up for her dragons, because I thought she made the, she created the greatest dragons of any literature I know, and I felt that after her dragons, Nobody else should be allowed to use them. And it was a joke between us for a long time. Ursula would say, um, it's almost impossible to get dragons off the carpet. Do you know how much trouble they got? They can't get them off the curtains, period. And I'd say, unicorns are very easy to housebreak. They practically always, always ask to go outside. And there was a running joke between us for many years. But the fact is that um, I'm resigned to it now. When I was a boy, my mother remembered, and I completely forgot that, I have to take her word for it, that I sat in front of her class. She, she taught, I think, the fourth grade then, third or fourth grade, and she sat in front of her, I had sat in front of her class most of the period, telling them about unicorns. And I've been about four at the time. And when the class was over, apparently I stood up and said, thank you, I'll come back sometime and tell you more about unicorns. At least that's the way my family tells it. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's the way it started, I suppose. And it started quite early. So you have published your first novel, Actually, without the unicorn, the fine and quiet place, and you were quite young. What has inspired you and what has drawn you to writing at all? I'm a storyteller. It's what I do. That's the one thing I've ever felt I had any talent for. <coughs> I was a terrible student and a strange kid and with only a few friends. And the one thing I knew that would make me acceptable to other people on this strange planet was to tell stories. And that's really what I've done all my life. I've learned to pass myself off as halfway human. But, um, but when I'm not working, when I'm not writing something, it just feels very strange. And I'm coming up on 80, I'll be 80 next year. And this is still that thing I do. But you have tried storytelling not just through the medium of literature, but also screenplays and an opera libretto. What are the main differences between writing a novel or a short story and a screenplay or a libretto? And what did you find most surprising or Oh, let's say, most different about these different methods of storytelling? 
Well, there are all different ways of telling stories. And you learn. Writing a screenplay, for the most part, is a craft. You can learn to do it. If you stay at it, and I have a lot of help from other screenwriters and for producers I would. And you learn simply, well, the classic thing is simply um, keep the budget in mind. Keep how much this movie or this television screenplay is going to cost. Try to keep your character, try to keep the scenes indoors as much as you can because outdoors will break your budget. You'll never get the thing made. So the economic aspect of it is always there. When you're writing a novel or a short story, you have a bigger budget than anybody. You can take your characters anywhere you like. With screenplays, you're always aware of the cost. And when you're writing an opera, which was fun, I really enjoyed working with a composer, but you're always aware of the demands of the stage and the, um, the size of the orchestra. And there's just a lot of extra things that have nothing to do with the writing itself. But I like that. Um, there's a challenge. And I love music and anything to do with it. So I'm very proud of that opera. It's the only one I've ever done. I had a good time. Do you consider writing another one? After all, you have experience with both writing, very extensive, and with music. You have performed, right? I'm sorry? You have performed music at um, oh. conventions and so on. The only other thing I can do halfway is sing. When I was a boy, a lot of the time I couldn't talk to people, but I could always sing. That's different. And for 12 years, I was dinner music in a French restaurant in Santa Cruz, California. I sang mostly in French, sometimes in Spanish because I've got Mexican cousins. And when I knew that my German translator was going to be visiting, and he's an old friend of um, he was wandering through, being a young Van der Vogel, a, po a poet, doing odd jobs, um, borrowing my Lani Lania records when he got homesick, babysitting my children. And when I knew that he was going to be coming back to Santa Cruz for a visit, I worked up Mac the Knife in German, which is the way it was originally written, but I'd never sung in German. I worked very hard on that. When he when he came into the restaurant, you know, I broke into Und der Eifisch, der hat Sängen, und betrifft er in Gessisch. And he got very excited and got up and sang with me. And afterwards, when the dinner was over, everybody got home, I'm putting the guitar away. I asked, Jürgen, how did that go? It sound all right. I've never sung in German before. And he said, wonderful, wonderful, perfectly Yiddish. <laughs> Which is perfectly true. Of course it did. Have you considered writing a story set in the world of music or in the world of film? Finally, um, there was an English writer, G.K. Chesterton, who said, it is the best trade in the world to make songs, and the second best to sing them. Thinking about it, I agree with him. That's about it. I still love writing songs, and I wrote The Last Unicorn, and nobody ever believes this. The book was a complete nightmare. I labored over it, I dragged it out, I rewrote parts of it. I didn't think it'd ever be done. But I love writing the incidental songs which are in the book. That was fun. By the way, do these songs of the bandits in the last Inferno's Forest also exist somewhere, compiled? After all, the bandits were all about getting the songs published and well-known. Mm -hmm. um, I'm terribly out of practice, but I still do write songs. And and nothing else, I like walking along the street, singing them to myself. 
the same way that I sing the old French and German and Spanish songs to myself. I don't want to forget the lyrics. The lyrics are important. And the main thing is to, for me, is to keep yourself company. I usually sing when I walk. Just, just not, as I say, remember the lyrics, but also just for the companionship. And speaking of the last unicorn, it fascinated me how this world combined, let's say, ordinary elements with a world of beautiful magic and of unicorns. And it's not your only novel that has this very rare combination because in a fine and quiet place you see uh, people living in a cemetery, ghosts in love, and they're living a sort of normal life. And in Calabria, Claudio, a farmer, meets a unicorn and it changes his life completely. But he has been such uh, an ordinary person before, very relatable, not just some kind of aloof fantasy hero that we can sometimes see. So how do you achieve this beautiful juxtaposition of the ordinary and the beautiful and supernatural? It's a trick. I don't know how else to put it, but you're aware of doing that. Um, I, um, I think my proudest, the review I'm proudest of was by the cartoonist Gail Wilson, who said in some review, Beagle doesn't do apocalypses. Um, Beagle's characters are mostly peasants. Um, his wizards are out there in the, in the rain trying to get a, start a spell. And you have more effect when you do make that transition, if you do it in the right place. In one of my stories I'm proud of, for a lot of reasons, is a story called La Lune Tapon, The Moon Waits For You. And the main characters are two old Louisiana Creoles who are werewolves. I, they're old. I worked on the idea that it's a gen genetic thing, that you need two werewolves to breed, to breed true. And both characters have deliberately gone out of their way to marry out. Their wives had no notion of what their husbands were. Their children, grandchildren, don't know their heritage either. And the old men are content with that. They haven't killed anything in a very long time. They go to the supermarket. Yes, they do change with, um, when the moon is full. But then they lock themselves into a cabin. They all together, lock the doors very carefully so even they can't get out of full, full form. They've done this a long time. But there comes a point when the old black werewolf, Arsene is forced by circumstances to tell his oldest daughter that she's half werewolf, that that is her heritage. He doesn't want to do it, although he thinks she's the only one in the family with sense enough to cope with it, the news. But he's generally uneasy. He expects um, revulsion, horror, any number of reactions, but not what he gets. Her daughter, his daughter is very quiet for a while, and then she says, so that's why I can never do anything with my hair. That's what my oldest daughter would say if she found out she was half werewolf. And that's what a human being would say. She is one. And you learn to try things like that out. If that doesn't work, when you look at it, you try something else. The one thing I have always told writing classes when I've spoken to them is that I have never learned anything with, except by doing it wrong. I don't know anybody who writes perfectly in the first moment of putting things down on the page. Everybody rewrites, some more than others. I rewrite a lot. But um, I probably could write more if I didn't write as slowly as I do.
But for me, it's necessary to find out whether that works or not. No, there's something wrong with that line. I'm not sure what it is. I have to trust myself, okay? It's got to be some other line. And I walk around in circles a good deal of the time where I work, mumbling to myself. I have, to this day, a little sign in my wall in the room where I work. It's the same old sign that I had um, years and years ago. When I lived somewhere else, um, was living another life, had a lot of animals sharing the office with me. But what I wrote on the card was what I'm always saying to myself. Thank you, Schmuck. Thank you, Schmuck. And sooner or later, if I nag myself enough, I'll find a way out. But, but it's slow. But speaking of this writing process, you have eventually published two versions of the last unicorn. First, the second one, which we all know, which Mandrake and Molly and the Bandits, and then the one that you have started originally. Do you have uh, other so far unpublished drafts of stories that we know and that we might, let's say, meet someday in another version? No, the last unicorn is a fluke in a lot of ways. I spent that particular summer of 1962 sharing a cabin in the Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts with my best friend, who has been my best friend since we were five years old. He's always been the painter, the same way I've always been the storyteller. We knew that early on. And we drive each other crazy. We still laugh, and he lives the other side of the country from me. We still laugh in a particular way that I don't seem to laugh with anybody else. And that was going to be our professional summer. He was going to be painting all summer out in the beautiful woods around us. And I, I already published a final private place, but I didn't know what to do next. I'd spent a year at Stanford writing a novel that will never be published. Um, it's got good bits in it, but it, it goes when I do. And I made a couple of false starts on short stories, but no, that's not it. And meanwhile, I wanted to, to have something to show him when he came back from the painting. I was sketching in the woods all day. I wanted to show him that I'd been working too. And finally, I decided on the last unicorn and plunged into it. And it's very different from the book you may know. There's no Schmentry and no Molly. Which amazes me now, because Molly is so much the heart of the book. I'm very clear on that. No Molly, no Last Unicorn. But there is a two-headed demon. Um, the, there's one head on his shoulders, and another one at the end of a very long neck that sticks out from between his shoulder blades. And the heads talk to each other. And they talk to each other very much the way my friend Phil and I talk to each other, we still do. They're, they snipe at each other, they mock each other, they have a purpose, they're going somewhere. And the other one goes along with them for a while. But I was making it all up as I went along, and I didn't know what came next, or what I should be doing. And this is more or less the way I have always worked. I do not recommend it to anybody. I tell people to make outlines of their books, at least know something, at least know the ending, but something. And even after all these years, I'm still mo mostly making it up as I go along. I'm just, I'm better at it than I was, inevitably, but it's still silly. It's, I can't believe a grown man still doing that stuff, spinning you know, spinning a tail and hoping it comes out all right because I never know how the books are going to end. I never do. Does it work similarly in screenplays if you have more of a free hand about the story? No, because that's different. Because I'm, I'm a hired hand. 
I am working for people who hired me to write a script the best I can, but they're paying me. And I'm very conscious about that. Um, I feel, in a lot of ways, like the actress, French actress Simone Signoret, who wrote a, a memoir some years back that has the same title in English as in the French edition. Nostalgia isn't what it used to be. And she says, whether it's a movie or, or a stage play, if I'm, when I'm just starting to get a grip on the character I'm supposed to be playing, and I begin to give her my voice and have her walk the way I do, I'll stop and tell the producers, look, if this isn't what you want, I can try it another way, or I can just give you your money back. And then the play opens, or the movie comes out, and it gets good reviews, sometimes very good reviews, and I find myself saying, well, Senior Ray, you fooled them one more time. But sooner or later, they're going to discover that you can't act. And it's kind of like that, even for a writer, the only difference is that I'm not working on anybody else's budget. I'm doing it myself. If it gets published, that's good. If it doesn't get published, and that has happened, all right, I still like it. I'll just try something else. Let's talk about screenplay for Sarah, the Star Trek episode that she wrote. Was it the whole, your original idea to introduce Spock's father in the episode, or did it stem from the needs of the whole series? And how did you think of having Sarah go through uh, what humans may perceive as dementia or Alzheimer's? It was very sensitively done and quite unusual in a series such as Star Trek. This is another thing about being a writer. And that was the winter of 1990. And things were, things were hard. My wife and I were living on an island just off Seattle. And if I didn't sell something to somebody pretty soon, it was going to be a very hard winter. And I haven't. This is a, I owe a friend this and she doesn't remember doing it. A writer named Diana Gallagher called me to tell me that usually Star Trek the Next Generation already has all its scripts written to be at the begin the season to begin the season. But there have been a, 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 I'm not sure, I think somebody came down sick. But in any case, one or two scripts weren't handy. They needed outside scripts and as quickly as they possibly could. And if I hustled down there early enough, perhaps I could sell them a story. And I remember that I, I, I bought the first-class tickets from Seattle to Los Angeles, which I never do, of course. But the theory was that if I get the job, I'm going to want a couple of drinks on the way home to celebrate. If I don't get the job, I'm going to need a couple of drinks on the way home. And my son-in-law, my older daughter, were living very close to the Paramount Studios then. They met me, my son-in-law met me at the airport. And I told him, I'm dropping off here, and give me about an hour and a half. Um, one way or another, you'll know whether I got the job or not. And I went in to Paramount and met with the story, the story editors. And with the woman, Melinda Snodgrass, bless her, who was the major story editor there. And I did what I always do because it's the only thing I know to do. I told them a story. And I more or less made up that story about Sarek, who I always, who always fascinated me as a character anyway. And I always wanted to work with Mark Leonard. And I knew something was happening because they were taking notes, taking notes, and then at a certain point, they stopped taking notes and just listened while I told them the story. And I 
think I, think I got the job. There's a side, uh, side element to this. I don't, I don't know if it's true now, but back then, 1990, the, the, the more power, powerful you were in the screenwriting world, the poorer you looked, the poorer you dressed. Melinda was clearly wear, was wearing a ratty little leather miniskirt, and the, the two or three producers I met had clearly thrown on what was closest to the bed that day. So I got in with my son-in-law, and he pulled out, and as he started out in the mouth, he turned to me and said, I turned my back on you for an hour and a half, and you pick up the three janitors and the cleaning lady. Which is about what it looked like, I suppose. But, but I wrote I wrote the script and they filmed it pretty much the way I wrote it, which is unusual. I attribute it to the fact that I made friends with Belinda Snodgrass, and she did the best she possibly could to preserve the script. Because you remember when you're doing this, there are other people ready to rewrite your scene at any moment. So the fact that it comes out as well as it does. It's a minor miracle. I just wanted to give Patrick Stewart, who's a great actor, and I just wanted him to be able to say something besides make it so. So I'm very proud of the scene that I wrote of his mind, mind melting and sorry. That's about as good as I get screenplays. It's the same very proud. And when you write a new character and conceive him or her in your mind, how do you pick what's the struggle of that character? Because uh, Sarai struggles with losing his cow and his Vulcan moment, and Claudio in Calabria struggles with the loss of his wife and child, and Schmendrick from The Last Unicorn struggles with not being able to do magic as he wants. How does this come to you and what's in general your character writing process? My characters, and I live with them, are always flawed one way or another. I can't do superheroes. It's just not in me. I'm very fond of all my characters. Some, some I truly love and worry about even though the stories are finished. But I find myself worrying about how they're doing. So they were real people, to me they are. And as I say, um, you listen to the voices. You can hear them. Um, a woman once tapped my head and said a little sadly, all those people up in their party, and I'm not invited. And I'm not always invited as I told her either. But I have to listen to the voices. I understand, I'm sure, Joan of Arc really did hear voices in her head. Because to me, that's at least real. I may mean, not always understand the characters or quite know how to deal with them, how to listen to them. But, but they're always there. And if they're not there, if they don't talk to me, I'm in trouble. And are you sometimes inspired by real people in your surroundings? I'm sorry? Are you sometimes inspired by real people around you? Inevitably, of course, you listen to people as well as your characters. I don't always realize until later that that character is so based on somebody I was living with, somebody I've known all my life. I don't always know that. But most of the time, I don't, people ask me about that. I don't base characters directly on people I know. I'll borrow a little bit here, a little bit there, and so on. But sometimes I don't know until we get the, the original people. Most likely won't know either. And what about taking inspiration from issues in the real world? What's uh, your take on the environment and using it in uh, speculative fiction? I'm not sure. That is, um, I know, for instance, that. In Calabria is based, not based, the, the heroine, that's what she is. Giovanna 
is based on, at least a little bit, on a dear friend of mine, who most likely would not be recognized by anybody who's read the book, simply because she's black, she's poor, she still lives in her car. It worries me a lot because I've been away for a week and I need to know that at least she's all right, her daughter's all right. And the only giveaway, really, is the dedication it says um, to, you know, this book, this book is for um, Ayesha L. Collins. Um, brave, brave and beautiful, always, always, even when weary and sad. And the heroine in the book, Joanna, has something of her spirit, something of her particular kind of courage. But she's read the book, and I know she doesn't see herself in it, which is fine, I'm not playing games. Well, I, I, what I know is another matter. And I was delighted. The one that, aspect that I really did work some work on were the Indrangheta, the Calabrian equivalent of the Mafia. I was found out that I could um, asked a number of old Italian friends. I was delighted to discover, especially recently, that the Intrangheta is even, are even tougher and meaner than I thought they were. I didn't make them up. Um, it's tricky when you're dealing with real events or real locales. I, I wrote a novel I'm quite fond of called Tamsin which is my other book, Bill's Story, after a violent private place. And it takes place partly in New York City, where I grew up, I can vouch for that one. But mostly it takes place in Dorset, in England. And it's the poorest county in England, it always was. And I've never been there in the first draft. I did get there between the first draft and the second draft. It did make a difference. But I was very nervous when I sent it to an English writer who was a good friend whom I'd never met. We were always going to meet the next time I came to London. But I admired her work enormously. I mean, we wrote back and forth a couple of times a week. And finally, I worked, my, worked up my nerve and sent her a copy of Tamsin. And she wrote back, you might have been born in Dorset. Well, she was very kind, and she was a good friend, and it's hard for me to believe that um, she really thought that. Maybe she did, but she was kind in any case. You never fully know what's real to other people. It may not be something that's real to you. Once the book is done, you have no more control of it if you ever did. Tamsin was hailed by many critics for its strong female character. It was very relatable and very realistic. And in my opinion, so is Joanna, so is Molly, so is Zeus, and other women that you have wrote, or girls in case, for example, of Zeus. Is there a secret to it? Only being interested, but like that. Um, for whatever reason, my, somewhere in me, my female characters interest me not necessarily more than the men, but in a different way. I never get to the bottom, to the bottom, to the end of these characters in particular. And I do think about that. And I can't honestly say what makes them, for me, a bit more piquant, a bit more interesting. But um, I've known a lot of strong, strong, interesting women, starting with my mother, my cousins, my first girlfriend. And so I was marked very early on by that interest. And I'm very lucky in the people I've met, the people who have affected
expected. And I was at least quick enough to realize that they were interesting. And that there are heroes and heroes. And I think that something similar can be said not just about your human characters, but also those who have been different before. Because in the last unicorn, Schmendrick actually changes the unicorn into a human, like the Amatia. I didn't know he was going to do that. That's another thing about writing books. I really didn't know that was going to happen. And, um, but transformations are part of folklore, very much so. And I'll tell you something I don't tell everybody. There is one book that is, and can be called an ancestor of the last unicorn. It's James Thurber's novel, it's often thought of as a children's book, called The White Deer. And that really does, does have a connection to the last unicorn. And only one person has ever picked it out. And of all things, that was a songwriter, composer, Broadway, Broadway show writer, um, who wrote the songs for things like Wicked and Pippin and so on. And he caught the resemblance right away. The result is that each of us is a copy of a white deer autographed by the other. But um, nobody else has ever noticed it. I know. It is about a woman, about a good fairy tale about you know, Prince particularly. There are three sons, but he falls in love with a, a woman who may or may not be a deer. And this runs in the family because his mother was the same sort, same sort of thing. His mother perhaps was a, a deer who felt love changed into a human being. Was she always more dear than human? He's never known. He just loved his mother and her. His father has never gotten over her. And, and this becomes a question in this story. Yeah, is this, this white deer a deer changed into a human? Or a human changed into a deer? It's different. In the last unicorn, Lady Amaltia has basically changed into a human fully when she fell in love with Prince Lear. And I have always wondered, and it was partly answered in the story Two Hearts, how did these character, characters cope with uh, this kind of separation later when she was changed back into a unicorn and Lear had the, you could call it, mundane task, but a very hard one of uh, rebuilding the whole kingdom. Well, she makes it, she makes it very clear. Um, she knows that she is different from every other unicorn anywhere because, she, she says, no unicorn was ever born who could ever, ever could regret but I do. I regret. And she's going to have to live with that. The magician Schmenter realizes that without meaning to, yeah, he has, he has done her bad too. And yet, and yet he would not do it. And speaking of the, let's say, emotions of unicorns, it was very interesting when you mention a Chinese unicorn, could you please elaborate on that? Well, there are at least three unicorns in folklore that I know of. One is the one in the last unicorn, the Western unicorn. And there's a Chinese or Japanese Asian unicorn, almost, well, partly a creature of water. And then there's, uh, then there's the carpet down. I think I might have been, the, might be the only one to write a story about the 
Persian cuneiform because the Kar Karkatan is large, powerful, fierce, and um, not at all like the other unicorns in my stories. This one, well, this one probably has its bearings, its roots, and Marco Polo, when he traveled in Asia, wrote in his journal that he had seen the unicorn. And then he adds, rather sadly, I never thought unicorns would be so ugly. And you realize they probably saw rhinoceros. And the story of the Karkadon is probably derived from the story of the rhinoceros. But um, for me, that, in a way, that's perhaps the most interesting of those stories. Because it was a challenge to see if I could use the, the Karkadon as a real character and how it affects human beings. What was that like? And I say, it stays with me. I keep thinking, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't have tried it. But I like the story. The hero is, by the way, the boy who comes close, as close as anybody could to Taming a crocodile, you can't do it. But in a way, he almost did. I named him for a Persian friend of mine in college. You know, probably my best friend in college in Pittsburgh in the 1950s. And I was very fond of him. He was could never decide whether he wanted to stay in the United States and become a doctor and make a million dollars. Go back to go back to Iran and kill the Shah. It was one or the other. I never. I was. I wrote about him in the introduction to that story, hoping that he stayed in the United States and that today he's an extremely wealthy doctor because he wasn't really cut out for a religious revolution. I couldn't imagine that. Do you have friends from all over the world? France, Iran, Germany, and you also uh, sometimes have inspiration from different mythologies across the world. How do you think this has influenced your writing uh, as a whole? And are you perhaps uh, planning to come up with another story based on mythology or which we haven't seen yet? I never know. Um, on the one hand, I'm writing the present. It's just a story called Soos, S-O-O-Z, which is also told as Two Hearts was by a young girl. And when Two Hearts is a sequel to The Last Unicorn, after 37 years of refusing to write one. And the it's told by a 19-year-old girl. And here, in Suze, she's 17 now. And for this one, I'm sort of making up my own mythology as I go along. But there is a novel that I want to write after that that goes back to having, having known over the years and worked with them a lot of old actors. And I was came partly came to, to um, the Czech Republic because, because of a, a legend that goes back to the, the time of the Jewish, court, Jewish quarter and the legendary Rabbi Lowe. This would be the story of the Golem. I always thought that Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, must have known that original story. And it has to do with, the well, one I'm conceiving has to do with three old actors famous for horror movies, Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, and Lon Chaney Jr. And I like to imagine, suppose, suppose Ben Lugosi 
really were a vampire. But he's as sick as he looks as very sick all the time. But suppose it has to do with the fact not that he's a drug addict, but that he's really doing the best he, the best he can to kick the dependence on blood. What about Lon Shane Jr.? Suppose he really were a werewolf. And Boris Karloff, whom everybody loved, I, one of my dear friends, I, the actress Anna Lee, who was an actress for 70, 70 years, was very favorite. She was very proud of the two movies, but one that she had made of the Karloff was her favorite. And what if kindly, courteous, gentle voice of Boris Karloff were actually the goal? Anyway, after I get Sue's done, I think I'll finally work my way up to, to try and get another one. I don't know where that'll go or what I could possibly do with that. I simply don't know. Sometimes you really have to put them aside because you're not quite old enough to do that yet. Since we have about 10 minutes left, are there any questions from the audience? Don't be too shy. Yes, there's a question. Sorry, it is about unicorns. Um, I just wanted to say how uh, through the movies, uh, it was really a story close to my heart. And I know it's true for a lot of my female friends when we grew up. And what we only, what we only realized uh, later, I think that it's a really special to have this female strong character, but she's also vulnerable and she needs her friends. Whereas with a lot of fantasy that gets popular, I feel it caters to boys and the women are either damsels or they're really perfect fairies. So I wanted to ask, was any of this conscious? And also, do you think of any specific readers when you write your story? So in case someone uh, didn't hear the question in the back, I will try to summarize it shortly. Uh, it's about the last unicorn and about uh, a strong female character who uh, is very independent, but she also needs friends. And uh, today we see lots of fantasy that mostly caters to boys and the female characters are damsels in distress and so on. So, was the decision to use um, a really cool, strong female character who also uh, cannot do her quest alone conscious? Actually, actually, I've noticed that there are more and more strong female characters um, turning up in fiction, in television. Um, I think about that because I think the turnaround might have come with one of my favorite television shows, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I would love to have written for, really wanted to. And it is, it, I, I just noticed it changing. I don't know about video games. Video games strike me as still largely male, yet, right now. But for me, as I said, the female characters tend to be more interesting. There, there are more things you can find out about them. I know that if I'm working on a story or a novel, and there isn't a, long, a strong female character in it, that usually brings me up short. No, that's not right. Let me try that another way. Um, no, it needs a woman. I've already sliced it. needs a female character, a good one. And I'm still learning as this goes along. But, but it's, always, it's always been there. Um, I take um, female characters probably even more seriously than I take all the men, men's ones. There's just always more you can do. There's more you can listen to. So much of it has to do with listening to my female characters. Try to hear what they're trying to tell me. It's a slow process, and 
That's why I'm very grateful that my mother lived to be 100 years old and that my father lived well into his mid 80s because I learned so many. Is there another question? Yes. Uh, I read some of your short stories, short stories in uh, fantasy and science fiction magazine, with the Czech edition. What is the uh, is the difference between writing short stories and long stories, and what is the difference? So, in case someone didn't hear it, what's the difference between writing short stories and long ones, such as novels? I go back and forth. I used to feel that I write so slowly that I might as well write a novel, because it's just going to take me too long. You know? But, in fact, I've written four or five books of short stories that surprises me very much. I like living with a book with a long story because usually it takes me that long to figure out what I'm doing. And for me, that's a slow process. A lot of the time I'm wrong and I'll go back and make it look as though I always knew what I was doing. But um, sometimes I look back at a short story and think, that came out of Oh, I didn't remember that. Oh, I like that. Um, again, I'm also a slow learner about what I've done. Um, I think I still think in terms of novels. I think probably my natural length is a short novel or a long story, a novella, as they call it. You, you do find your own tone, your own length, your own rhythm. It varies very much from here from my right to my right. Another question? If there is one, I would like to ask about magic in your works. Because uh, in a lot of contemporary fantasy, we can see elaborately constructed magic systems that resemble science more than magic. And in your stories, magic is usually more intuitive, more mysterious, and supernatural. Did you choose this consciously, or do you think this is something that magic needs to be to remain magical? I think a good example I'd give it is a story of mine called The Weremouse of Millicent Bradley Middle School. It's told by, by a, a boy in middle school, who's very, loves his sister, is very protective of her, she's very bright. And when she, everybody knows that this particular math teacher is a witch. The white children know these things. Nobody says anything about it, it's just, yeah, you know, I've got to take her class, she's a witch, but that's all there is to it. And there's no point in telling your parents about it, because they wouldn't listen. But um, this particular case, the boy's sister offends the witch. That is, um, she's come to the defense of another student. And that's punishment, right? The, the witch has changed her into a warehouse. That is, from time to time, she'll change into a mouse. But like a werewolf, she doesn't know when it will be. She can't be sure. It'll be the full moon that does it. But the boy has to, has to help her. He doesn't quite know what to do or where to go for aid. But finally, he turns to somebody who is in a way out of my past. It's a homeless man living in the street in well, the story, basically, in San Francisco. And the man is based on somebody I knew who did live on the street in downtown San Francisco, and to whom I used to bring books because he was always reading. And I knew that if I were ever homeless, that would, I would be exactly like that. I'd manage as long as I had something to read. So the book, the book has always gotten in good with it by bringing the books. But now, he has to ask Big Mac, which is what they call the man, got to ask the question. Favor and tells him about what's happened to his sister 
And what went through for her? How, how do you deal with a witch? Big Mac isn't quite sure. We asked a friend who would know. And he tells the boy to come back um, a couple of nights. And the boy does come back and finds Big Mac, the tall, skinny, black woman, um, who knows something. She said, what she? She tells the boy, all right, this is going to take a little magic. And tells her, tells him, um, they need to get certain ingredients for a package, a small package. And she, Big Mac, turns out, knows something about witchcraft himself, so they fall to debating the two old people. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be graveyard, graveyard dirt, does it? No, that's just talk, any dirt will do. But graveyard dirt, dirt is better. And the boy, comes back to see them, and especially the, the black woman makes a small, small package that the boy is instructed to put into the English te the math teacher's hand. You have to do that. Nobody can do it for you. You have to push it your hand, close your fingers around it, just do it. And at this point, Black woman, whom the whom Big Mac just calls herself, herself can't tell him anymore because her daughter has just come to take her away, and um, the daughter is very respectable, middle class, has a city job, and mourns her mother. You've got to stop messing with that stuff. I know, like last time, I remember. You know where I put you. Um, herself is particularly impressed. She just straightens up, you know, hands the boy the, the packet and just tells her daughter, let's do Chinese. I haven't had Chinese for a long time. And they go off together. That's the last the boy sees her. But um, he tells um, he tells his sister what they're going to have to do to keep her from changing into a mouse on a moment's notice because he's going crazy trying to keep their parents from noticing, keeping anybody from noticing. At one point she's changed into the she's changed in the girls' dressing room in their school. And that's the most horrifying thing. A boy of that age can imagine he's gonna to have to go in there, whether or not advice there or not, and find his sister, whom he already knows is gonna be a mouse for. Him. And and in the end story. Um, when there comes that moment of um, pushing the push, pushing the packet into the witch's hand, for a moment the sister freezes. She just can't do it. She's too frightened. But then she recovers herself and she does put the witch, witch's hand and close her fingers around it. And the witch is shamed changes on the spot from into something like a cross between you know, a ferocious bird and a wasp, a large wasp. And she hurtles out through the window and is never seen again. And anyway, writing that story, I was trying to make it, I was trying to make the magic real when they have to go to that. I think this is a beautiful way how to finish the discussion. A combination of the, let's say, mundane life and something magical and extraordinary. So I would like to thank Peter so much for being here. So please, a round of applause for Peter.